If we want to prove that some individual thing exists, it suffices just to exhibit one. So for example, white peacocks exist. But often we want to prove not just that some one individual exists, but rather that for every element of some relevant set, there exists something that's related to it in some way. So for example, every integer has a successor or every kangaroo had a mother. In these cases, we can't exhibit just a single object. Instead, we can try a proof by construction. Such proofs have a simple structure. We first clearly state the claim that we want to prove. Then we describe an algorithm that, given any element of the input set, constructs the required related object. And finally, we have to prove that the algorithm is correct. In other words, that it actually does what we say it will do. The power of a proof by construction is that it not only proves the required claim, it also, as a possibly practical matter, acts like a map that tells us how to find a related object whenever we need it. Let's look at some examples. Constructive proofs are common in geometry. Let's prove that for any line segment L1, there exists another line segment L2 that is a perpendicular bisector of L1. Note that drawing L2 in this particular case doesn't prove our claim. We must prove that there exists such an L2 for any initial L1. And we can do that by construction. Using compass and straight edge, we seek to find a perpendicular bisector of the line segment L1. To do that, first we take the compass and set the distance on the compass to the length of the line segment L1. Then we draw some arcs from the two endpoints to get these two points, which then are equidistant from the endpoints of the line segment L1. Connect those two points using a straight edge. And the claim is we have created a perpendicular bisector of L1. We shall call it L2. Now, we won't go through the proof of why that is, but just a sketch of the proof. If we put in some triangles right here, what we could show is that this angle is equal to this angle and that this length is equal to this length. The two angles being equal guarantee the perpendicularity of the line L2 with respect to L1. The fact that these distances are exactly the same shows that this is actually a bisector of the line L1. So we have, with compass and straight edge, constructed a perpendicular bisector L2 to the line segment L1. Construction proofs are also useful for computing numerical values. Here's a very simple example. Consider the claim that if A and B are reals and A is not zero, then there exists a unique real R such that AR plus B equals zero. We actually have to prove two subclaims here. The first is that R exists. The second is that it's unique. As is common, we can use construction to prove the existence claim. And then, as is also quite common, we'll prove the uniqueness claim by contradiction. We'll first prove by construction that R exists. Starting with our original equation, we can do some simple algebra, which results in a formula that can be used to construct R given any A and B. The correctness of this formula follows from the algebraic derivation and the assumption that A is not zero. Now let's prove that R is unique. We know that AR plus B equals zero. Suppose that there were some other value S such that AS plus B also equals zero. Then AR plus B is the same as AS plus B. We again do some simple algebra and we get that S is in fact equal to R contradicting our assumption that some different value exists. Thus, no other values satisfy the equation. Now consider the following problem. We want to compute 3 to the ninth power. The straightforward way to do this is to do 8 
multiplications. This works, but it's slow, and it would be a lot worse if we were to compute 3 to the 50th power. In general, it takes n minus 1 multiplications to compute x to the n using this technique. A more efficient algorithm would be better. Consider the claim that a more efficient algorithm exists. Specifically, for any real x and integer n, it is possible to compute x to the n using no more than 2 times log base 2 of n multiplications. So, for example, to compute 3 to the 50th using the straightforward algorithm takes 49 multiplications. To compute it using the efficient algorithm we claim exists would take no more than 10 multiplications. By the way, the difference between 49 and 10 may not seem like a lot, but if we needed to solve an even bigger problem, it would be. In fact, if we were raising a number to the 1 millionth power, the difference is 999,999 multiplications versus only 27 multiplications. Take a look at this graph. The orange line plots the growth, as n gets large, of n minus 1. That's the number of multiplications for the simple algorithm. Contrast that with the gray line, which plots the growth of 2 times log base 2 of n, which is the number of multiplications for the more efficient algorithm. Typically, we prove complexity claims like this by a construction. We prove that an algorithm exists by exhibiting it. Here it is. The key idea behind it, and the basis for a proof that it is correct, is this. The straightforward algorithm multiplies by x, in this case 3, at every step. The efficient algorithm doubles the power at every step. So now we multiply by 9, and now we multiply by 81, and so forth until we don't need to double anymore. Of course, to complete a formal proof of our claim, we must prove the correctness of the algorithm that we've just presented. We won't do that here. In mathematics and computer science, we define an important structure called a graph. In this context, a graph is a set of nodes, sometimes also called vertices, and a set of edges, each of which connects a pair of nodes. Notice that it's possible for an edge to connect a node to itself. The degree of a node is the number of edges that touch it. So for example, this node has degree 3. A regular graph is one in which every node has the same degree. So this graph is regular, every node has degree 2, but this one isn't, since these nodes have degree 2 and these have degree 3. An n regular graph is a regular graph in which every node has degree n. So this is a two regular graph. Every node is touched by exactly two edges. And this is a three regular graph. Three regular graphs are also called cubic graphs. Graphs are important because they can be used to model a huge range of things, from molecular structures to the internet. So claims about them matter. Consider the following claim. For any even n greater than 2, there exists a cubic three regular graph of size n. We want to prove this claim. We can't do that by exhibiting any individual cubic graph, say this one. All this example proves is that the claim is true when n equals 10. We need to prove that it's true for every even n greater than 2. We can do that by construction. We'll present an algorithm whose input is n and whose output is a cubic graph of size n. First, arrange the nodes in a circle. Connect each node to its neighbor on either side and now connect each node to the one opposite it. We know that it's possible to do this last step because the number of nodes is even. So at the end of this process, each node is connected to its two neighbors in the circle and its opposite. So each node has degree 3. By the way, construction proofs often aren't unique. 
Let's look at another simple construction that also proves our claim. Arrange the nodes in two concentric circles with half the nodes in each circle. Connect each node to its neighbor on either side. Now connect each node in the outer circle to its matching node in the inner circle. By the way, physical layout isn't important in graphs. Only connectivity matters. So we didn't actually have to use circles. We did that just to make it easy to visualize the construction. And now let's look at one more kind of problem for which we're likely to want to use a proof by construction. Suppose that we have two very different looking sets, and we want to show that they're equivalent in some useful way. We can do that with two construction proofs. We first prove that given any element of the first set, there's an equivalent element of the second one. And then we prove the other direction. Let's look at an example. A regular expression is a pattern stated in a clearly defined pattern language. We can think of a regular expression as defining a language, by which we mean just a set of strings, namely those that match the pattern. For example, this regular expression defines the set of strings that contain zero or more a's, followed by a single b, followed by zero or more c's. So the language defined by this regular expression includes such things as a, a, b, c, and b, c, 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 c. We should probably mention that the term regular expression is used for two significantly different formalisms. The one we're describing here is different from the one that's implemented in many modern programming languages. Ours doesn't provide a way to remember the length of an arbitrary substring. Keep in mind the claim we're about to make and prove is only true of this formalism. A finite state machine is an abstract computational model. It consists of a finite set of states and a set of transitions that describe how the machine moves from one state to the next as it reads a sequence of input symbols. Here's an example. The machine reads strings of A's, B's, and C's. It starts in state 1. If it reads an A, it stays in state 1. If it reads a B, it goes to state 2. From there, if it reads a C, it goes to state 3. If it reads additional C's, it stays in state 3. On any other inputs, for example, a C in state 1, it goes to state 4. There are a couple of different kinds of finite state machines, but here we'll consider the kind whose job is to read an input string and then accept or reject it. When such a machine has read a complete input string, it accepts if it has landed in an accepting state, indicated here with a double circle. Otherwise, it rejects. We'll say that the language accepted by the machine is exactly the set of strings that it accepts in this way. Let's look at an example. On input A, A, B, C, the machine starts in state 1. It reads the first A and loops back to state 1. It reads the second A and again loops back to state 1. It reads the B and goes to state 2. Then it reads the C and goes to state 3. It's finished reading its input. It's in an accepting state, so it accepts. Now consider the following claim. Assume the definitions of regular expressions and finite state machines that we've just described. Then the two formalisms are equivalent. By that, we mean that the set of languages that can be described by some regular expression is exactly the same as the set of languages that can be accepted by some finite state machine. Another way to say that is that for every regular expression, there's an equivalent, in other words, corresponds to the same language, finite state machine, and vice versa. For example, this finite state machine accepts exactly the strings that match this regular expression. Any number of A's followed by a single B followed by any number of C's. The proof of this claim is by construction, actually two constructions. We first show an algorithm that takes as input a regular expression and builds an equivalent finite state machine. Then we show a second algorithm that takes as input a finite state machine and builds an equivalent regular expression. So you've now seen examples of several kinds of problems for which construction proofs are often useful. Geometry, the existence of numerical values, computational complexity, graph theory, and equivalence of different formalisms.